It's not the numbers that that excite me, it's the people. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. This week's Island Influencers guest is Nicola Bowker, founder and managing director at Nicola Bowker & Co. Nicola has lived and practiced on the Isle of Man since 2001 and runs a successful boutique firm of chartered accountants in Laxey, serving local businesses and individuals. Along with her small and loyal team, Nicola offers a realistically priced personal service to each client. She acts as a director for a few select clients who need a closer relationship and more guidance for the board than a typical accountancy practice can provide. And Nicola clearly loves what she does. Should she have any downtime, she loves being out and about on the island, either cycling on or off road or running from Saturday morning park runs to half marathons. And in 2019, she completed the Manx Mountain Marathon. Here's this week's conversation with Nicola Bowker in episode 48 of Island Influencers. So Nicola, welcome to Island Influencers. Thanks for coming all this way from Laxey this morning on a gorgeous day to be on the programme. Thank you. And you switched the water wheel on for me. <coughs> yeah, well, you know, if you come from Laxey, you've obviously you've got, got a thing about water wheels, so we have to make you feel right at home. <laughs> so tell me, how did you end up being in the Isle of Man with your own firm of accountants, chartered accountants? Can you tell me, tell the listeners your story? Oh, it goes way back, way back. So... I was a scout, a girl scout, when you were allowed to be, when you were 16 years old. Gosh. And uh, I ended up being the, the venture scout treasurer. Blimey. And the, the group treasurer showed me how to reconcile a bank account. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and uh, my mother had, days before her marriage, because she had to give up work when she got married, had uh, worked in a bank, so she was quite numerate. Right. And uh, she supported me with that. And... Uh, I, was, I did my maths O-level a year early mm-hmm. and uh, when it came to thinking about careers, I, um, I was also quite arty. I did my art O-level a year early as did well. You really? Gosh. I, I've basically never painted since, but <laughs> I told my art teacher, you're never going to make any money, I'm never going to make a living out of art. So um, I'm giving art up. And I did at, uh, at, uh, at the age of 15. Right. Career stopped, choice early made. <laughs> uh, but um, I carried on with the maths. It came to career choice. I thought, oh, I might like to be an architect, you know. I quite like drawing. Oh, I want to be an architect. Uh, so I phoned the Royal Institute of Architects. And days before the internet, so you had to phone up to ask for information about a career. And they didn't answer the phone. Blimey. My second choice. Because <laughs> they didn't answer the phone. <laughs> was being an accountant. <laughs> right. So I phoned the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Yeah. And they answered the phone. Picked up. Gosh. So um, my parents were in business, and I'm sure we'll come back to that in, in a bit, but my parents were in business. So I said, Mum, do you think you could get me some work experience at your accountants? And she said, yeah, sure. So I went to have a chat with Derek, who was the chief of the managing partner. And uh, I went and did some filing and, you know, bits yeah. and pieces. I was only 16. Yeah. And basically, I never stopped working for them until I was qualified. Oh, gosh. So, so, so what happened? I went from school holiday work, yeah. and it was brilliant because all my friends had to have Saturday jobs. But I went to work there four weeks in the summer, two weeks at Christmas and two weeks at Easter, and I earned more than my friends did all year round. And uh, he says, you get yourself your A-levels and um, enough qualification to start a, a training contract, and we'll take you on. And he was good to his word. Gosh. So um, by the time I actually left, uh, finished with the university, the, the firm had become Moore Stevens. It had been bought out by Moore Stevens. So I, I had a training contract with Moore Stevens. And, uh, and there we go. That's, that's how I became an accountant. I wasn't allowed to do my parents' accounts. And I well, do, what business were they? And what? They had a builder's merchant in, right. in North London. Um, it was a family firm that was passed down from my grandfather and neither myself nor my sister were interested in carrying it on. So um, it closed when my dad retired at virtually my age. But um, 
Um, Very young. Yes. So um, anyway, it was the only set of accounts I wasn't allowed to do in the building was mum and dad's set of accounts. But um, it was a great place to work, very supportive. And the days when you could actually go down to the tax office and pick up forms and things. And um, No, it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good grounding. I wasn't allowed to use a calculator. Um, my only tools were a blue pen, a red pen, a green pen, a black pen, a pencil and a ruler. Important to have the ruler. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, so that's how I became an accountant. Um, and when I qualified, I, I decided then I wanted to be in small practice. So I went to work for a very small firm in Milton Keynes. Right. Um, their main office was right opposite the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Silbury Boulevard in Milton Keynes, which was quite intimidating. Really? Um, but I was based in a, a little side office yeah. in, in Bletchley, as in Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park. Um, it was above a cycle shop, which was heated. The wh- workshop was heated with a paraffin heater. So the, my office smelt of paraffin. It was very unglamorous and it wasn't successful. I left there after three months. Oh dear. <laughs> and that's having given up your contract uh, with Moore Stevens. Yep. Yeah. So I'd left uh. big practice to go there. But I fell on my feet. I ended up working for Kodak. Um, obviously now the late lamented Kodak yeah but in its day was a massive organization and I had a whale of a time for seven years in industry I um, I went from internal audit where I saw every aspect of the company Uh, I went through to all the photo processing labs around the country I, I went to see how they extracted the silver out of the film to reuse it um uh, all the manufacturing processes, a lot of which obviously are done in the dark. Fascinating place to work. And I, I ended up selling massive photocopiers, x-ray film to the health industry. So I went to hospitals. Uh, I finally ended up in the treasury operations where we moved hundreds of millions of currency uh, around the world every month, fully hedged, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. It was a great little team. Gosh, absolutely. it must have been a massive company in those days. Absolutely. I needed a new calculator. By, I was allowed to use one by then. I needed <laughs> a new calculator because I didn't have enough digits on my calculator for Gosh. the sums of money involved. It was oh, massive. Yeah. So I got to travel as well. I got to go to the, go to the States with that. And it was a fabulous job. Um, but it was, it was a big job. By the time I was in Treasury, I had two young children, uh, a full-time nanny, um and do you know what the nanny had a better time than i did so i quit yeah i quit work full stop um to look after my children for a few years while they were young oh uh during that time i had my third child yeah and uh through my husband's work we ended up moving to the isle of man and very soon after i met you actually sharon yeah gosh (laughs) so um he uh international finance brought us here though obviously at the time i wasn't working yeah i remember meeting you and i remember finding out you were a, a, a stay-at-home mom but a chartered accountant which I thought was very impressive <laughs> not stay at home for very long so uh, I swiftly ended up working for a, a very small firm of accountants in Ramsey but within a couple of years I thought I can do this myself mm-hmm. uh, so I did yeah and here we are yeah. Nicola Bowker and Co. So uh, was, what year was that did you incorporate 2004 yeah and you've been at um so 17 years later yeah. we're still here big purple sign on yeah so on the laxi main new road is it, is it, is it laxi, laxi new road, road. yeah yep. yeah so uh, in between the dentist and the commissioner's offices well everyone knows it goes to the dentist where your office is <laughs> a lot of clients combine the two and yeah. i have some clients that sort of semi dribbling in my, <laughs> my well, colin, it's funny colin was a guest on the on the on the program oh gosh one of the very earlier episodes yeah. 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 So yeah, he's my dentist too. It's very handy because yeah. <laughs> if I'm late, they just ring and say, and I'll be there in two seconds and I'm there in two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, you know, so much for that. Is it, I mean, an interesting background that you've, that, you know, you, that your parents wouldn't let you uh, that look at their accounts, which you can understand why, can't you? Because, you know, money is one of those taboo subjects that you must find it in your job, maybe that clients don't necessarily want to talk about. I didn't about do their money. tax returns until they were in their last few years. They yeah. kept it all. Yeah, well, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, it, it, you know, it moves on really nicely to my, um, the questions I ask all my guests. And the first one is, um, if you don't mind me asking, of course, primarily I ask when I meet people in my role as a financial planner, I ask them, you know, how, do, how was money growing up? You know, what, how, what was your first experience of My first experience of money. Of money. Yeah. My first memory of money. Well, there's two memories, Um, but the overriding memory is sitting on a stool in my parents' shop, acting as cashier from the age of about five 
obviously supervised. <laughs> An old till, push the button, push the button, ting, went the till. Um, but yeah, um, alongside my mum or my dad, I'd, uh, I'd ring the sales through at the, on the shop. Um, but at the end of the day, the takings would end up uh, coming home to be banked. And uh, dad sat one end of the table. Mum sat the other end of the table and my sister and I sat at the sides of the table and the takings came out of my dad's shirt pocket yeah. and were passed via myself or my sister down the table to my mum who did the banking <laughs> Gosh. during the dinner. My goodness. <laughs> so my memories of money were, were literally cash yeah. passing down the table and uh, mum used to hide it in the loft in case we got broken into. I see. And sometimes the bank would say, this money's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least it wouldn't be as bad as getting money from the butchers. I remember I was a cashier at uh, Barclays and Peel and oh. God, Godfrey Kelly, bless him, he's, he's passed away now. But um, I remember his bankings would come and it'd be, all the notes would have lots of blood and mm. <laughs> all sorts of stuff <laughs> straight in the soil. <laughs> so my earliest experience of cash was in retail. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, so, Gosh. Uh, so of all the things you've done throughout your life so far then, Nicola, what's, um, what's given you the most fulfillment from a from personal perspective, but also from a business perspective? Obviously, personally, the, 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 the children. Yeah. It's, it's almost everybody's number one um, they're the, the most important thing yes they are in every parent's life I think mm. certainly mine business wise it's the one one thing that uh, sticks in my mind business wise is um, I went to sign up for um, the Northern Athletics Park Runs in Ramsey for yeah. the first time ever and uh, I know who it was it was Janice Kennish and she said I gave her my name to sign up and she said are you the Nicola Bowker <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so it's now me who takes your name when you sign up at the Northern Athletics <laughs> Park runs. But uh, yeah, so people still say to me, are you the Nicola, the Nicola Bowker? Yes, yeah. I am. So yeah, the Radio power of Vega. advertising, Manx yeah. Radio really works. If anybody wants to know, <laughs> yeah. I can swear by it. Yeah, so you are actually, you're on the board of Manx Radio, aren't you? I am a non, now a non-executive director yeah. at Manx Radio. I was actually the uh, management accountant there. For a few years when my practice was small, yeah, um, I did that alongside the practice and the practice grew. Uh, so I, I gave that role up to, uh, to Dave Wilson, who's currently in, in that role. Um, but they had me back uh, a couple of years ago now uh, as a non-exec director. A great team of people. It's a lovely place to be involved with. I have a lot of time for Max Radio. They've done my business a, a lot of good. Yeah. Uh, and I think they do their customers businesses a lot of good as well as obviously all the um public uh, broadcasting that they do yeah, um sure. which which very few people appreciate is is very labor intensive and it's not something a commercial radio station would ever entertain so manx radio is there for a reason it gives it it gives the island its identity otherwise it would be bland music bland radio pre presenters yeah. everywhere and uh, and i think uh, we're very very lucky to have manx radio in the form we've got it yeah they were the main broadcasters of howard o'clock weren't they indeed <laughs> howard o'clock yes yes it's amazing how many people tuned into those yeah those, i saw I, that was one of them yeah. statistics are, are quite uh, yes i did every day and the, the, the gin bottle was opened <laughs> <laughs> every day at the end of howard o'clock <laughs> oh, so, yeah expected <laughs> Oh, cool. So what do you do to relax then, Nicola? What do you do to keep your life in balance? My life generally revolves around running, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I first started running when I was at school. I was rubbish at PE. Primary school, I was the person the headmaster shook hands with because I came last at every race. Oh. Um, secondary school, I used to do the 800 and 1500 metres as a teenager because nobody else would. And I didn't mind. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. And then when I was in sixth form, the deputy heads came into the sixth form common room and said, who wants to go running with me? Bring your plimp soles tomorrow. Plimp soles. And we'll, <laughs> sorry, I'm a southerner, plimp soles. Um, and we'll go for a run. And we started off about, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us. And this was in Hatfield and Hertfordshire. And it wasn't very grand running. We ran along the side of the, uh, of the bypass and things. Mm -hmm. um, it dwindled down to me and him. We'd never be allowed these days. No. <laughs> But um, I loved it and I started running then. Mother didn't approve. I got all hot and sweaty. Ah. Later in my life, the children made it difficult. About 10 years ago now, I picked it back up. 
and I really enjoy it. I'm quite a competitive person, so I do like enjoying enjoy a race every now and then. I, yes. I do park on every Saturday in Nobles, which isn't competitive, but it can be. Yeah. And I upset my son last week because he's not been running during lockdown and I beat him and he says, beaten by my mother, I can't believe it. Uh, well, maybe it'll make him train. And... So he has a great incentive. Yeah, um, I would think that's so a good incentive. I, I, I discovered fell running, which is so hard, but it is wonderful in terms of mindfulness I'm, I'm not a huge fan of meditation mindfulness in the in the forced you sit there and you think about it or not think about it I don't, I don't really understand but do you know what when you're up in the hills you're on an uneven ground and uh, you can't think about anything other than what you're doing and then last week myself and my partner went up to North Brule after work it was freezing cold we were slightly underdressed and I was starving. And he had a chocolate bar in his bag. And I thought, oh. We got to the summit of North Barrow from uh, Black Hut. And we sat down with our backs to the, to the trig point, sharing this chocolate bar. And you look south and all you can see are the hills. You can't see any houses. You can't see any people. You can just see summit after summit after summit. That's and we've beautiful. been at every single one of them multiple times. Yeah. And it's just stunning. And that is mindfulness to me. Yeah. So, you know... I may be puffing and huffing, but you know what? You, you, you see some... I stop the, on the climbs, even in races. I stop and I take <laughs> in the view. Yeah. We had a horrendous climb last week. I look, looked at the view many times. <laughs> <laughs> Kept you going. Yeah, so, um, so that's what... I, I, and gardening as well. Just taking on a new house with a bigger garden. So that's nice. Great. And it's gardening in my jeans. Yeah, what are you uh, growing? Uh, vegetables as well as completely renovated a huge border taken right. everything out so we're just oh, about gosh. to replant it yep um, what are you going to do it with perennials I'm a huge fan of a mixed border so yep. a few shrubs mm -hmm. perennials uh, once it's in I don't like to mess with it too much I'm not uh, I'm not a big summer annuals person um, I, I like nature to do it itself. Yeah, I know what you mean. Although um, the ones that self-seed are handy. Yes, <laughs> I never object to those. <laughs> don't either. <laughs> oh, wonderful. But, but you also, uh, from, from memory, you, you did go back to your roots of accountancy by getting involved again in the Scouting Association, did you not? I did, well, I, I was a brownie when I was little. Ah, then okay. I was a guide. Yep. Um, but when I reached the age of being able to, to, to uh, go into scouts, I jumped ship immediately. <laughs> I had a great scout group I was involved in. The scouts used to do things like zip wires and campfires yeah. just in the middle of the week. And we never did any of that stuff for guides. So I joined the Venture Scouts then. And um, that's how I got into my treasurer role because Venture Scouts are very much sort of self-managing because it's yeah. the... Then back then it was the 16 to 21 age age range. It, it's shifted a little bit these days, but um, and we had some amazing a adventures there. We'd go off doing mountain competitions where you had to carry everything in your backpack, and it was a race. We'd go on this mystery train from Watford Junction to somewhere, and the ticket would these old fashioned train tickets would be printed with no destination. Oh gosh! So we had no idea where we were going until we got there, and it would be the Peak District or North Wales or something and you get dumped out of this train station you pitch your tent the next morning there's a kit check and you're on a timed two day race <gasps> uh, that sounds tremendous it was fantastic and there'd be a thousand scout, venture scouts doing this thing and it would be a huge huge event sounds a nightmare for risk management doesn't it these days I don't think it would happen these days <laughs> no in the days where you used to throw your kit in the lorry and just climb in the back of the lorry on top of your kit yeah, yeah no, that's no. Those, the days it was yeah. it wouldn't happen now but. so when you when you had your own children was it something that you wanted them to experience that sort of that's whole? how I got back into yeah. it my, my son was just approaching the age of eight when you start cubs he'd been a beaver in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Laxey uh, and the, the, the Cub Scout pack was full so I started another one right myself and a couple of uh, friends we started first Laxey King Ori Cub Scout pack yeah and um, and that kept going for, for several years uh, uh, to be fair I, ha I gave it up when the bi business life just got too busy yeah um, you were Arcala were you not I was Arcala and mm. it, it was um, yeah Sports days, I remember Laxey School doing the mother's race and I just have something <laughs> like 50 kids shouting, oh, Kayla, oh, okay, as I was running a down the mother's, mother's race, obviously trying to win it, which I usually did. <laughs> yeah, it's very competitive. 
<laughs> so tell me what the, what do you think are the best things about living in the Isle of Man? I think you've already uh, sold the the scenery of the, of the North Barul. Um, um, the Isle of Man is just a beautiful place inside and out in terms of obviously it's a beautiful island physically but I've always lived in a village well almost always lived in a village always been involved in in village life and living on the Isle of Man is like living in a big village so my clients will see me in the boardroom Uh, uh, you know I've, I've done presentations to Timble with Manx Radio sitting there very formally but they'll also see me with a bunch of Cub Scouts or in my fell running gear mm. covered in mud soaking wet <laughs> whatever <laughs> um so you know i like the fact that every, you can be genuine you know you see people for exactly who they are here there's no there's no falseness about the isle of man sometimes where you can have separate lives between work and life what you see in the workplace isn't always what you see outside the workplace but i'm very much a whizzy wig <laughs> what you see is what you get exactly yeah 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 good one yeah, well, so what would you say are the main challenges of the Isle of Man? What does it face? Leaving it at the moment. Um, <laughs> uh, the challenges for the Isle of Man going forward, I think there's a big threat from um, the United States at the moment. I think Joe Biden is, is, is I mean, as much as we all hated Donald Trump, I shouldn't say that's a generalisation. Obviously, not everybody hated gen- Donald Trump. Oh. Donald Trump was challenging. I don't think that's a totally unfair but, statement. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump was liked. challenging as an individual, yeah. but for the Isle of Man... He was no threat. Yes. Um, Joe Biden is a big threat, I think, to the Isle of Man. I think the threat is our corporate tax rate of zero. Yes. And I think that is going to be a huge challenge going forward to to remain, to to have some unique selling point for business going forward if we no longer can retain a a zero corporation tax rate. That's our biggest I, I can't think of a, of a bigger one than that. Attracting the right people to the island is a challenge. And I think it's partly the history of the island's business has created. The, the island has historically had a lot of um, the, the finance, I'll put it in inverted commas, uh, a lot of administrative staff, which are great, but th- there isn't a massive skill level in that sort of no, work. Automation has been filling in the gaps hasn't it and so the challenges are is is new industry requires much higher technical skills by it or mm. whatever it is they're much much higher level skills and the island has a deficit of those skills so what would what sort of things would you would you put on to train up the residents i i, I think the, the the college has a massive challenge i think it needs to and I know it, I've seen evidence of it uh, since the start of COVID. The retraining, the up skilling of of existing working population, or reskilling even maybe. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm afraid the world has turned it turned into a an advocate of paper qualifications. Um, so I think people um, really need to look at you know if if what they're doing now is is something that's disappearing they need to to rethink and and go back to school and future proof themselves maybe indeed and the children children the young people coming through you know really need to focus on on uh technical skills yeah to give themselves a future a a secure future skills which are transferable as well because if the worst happens you know we're still a small place if the worst happens uh, has has as has happened in in previous decades on the island where people have to leave to find employment they need to take skills with them because mm. <laughs> the, the the problem is same elsewhere you know the better skills the better you know yeah the the more resilient no, no, it's interesting yeah it's it's uh yeah it's what we can do about it and what influence we can have on the sort of things it's 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 an interesting one for uh for a future debate i guess mm. yeah okay thanks so what have you got planned next nicola what's what's next for you well <laughs> more of more of the same you know i i i absolutely love the clients in my business um um i i one phoned me this morning just before i came actually and he's a relatively new client and uh and i said hello to him he says do you know your clients all that well that you you know who you're speaking to you you know and you can picture us all i said yes i do know all my clients that well and uh and he was dead chuffed with that. And, and and that's it. It's being part of, whether it's personal tax or whether it's a large company 
where I can get, you know, meterly involved, or even if it's just a small company and we just have a chat once a year. I absolutely love being part of these these small businesses. It's what it's not the numbers that that excite me. It's the people and the businesses behind the numbers. They're all so different. I mean, I, the diverse di- diverse nature of my client base. I, I can't even say out loud here because some of them might be shocking to you. But um, you know, it's everything from dog groomers to multi million pound business from landscape gardeners through to consultant doctors you know it's it's everything and I just like to make numbers understandable to every person who's trying to who comes in and and has a need for our services so I like to explain it so that everybody can understand it it's not not some some mumbo jumbo it's 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 just what you have achieved with your own hard work mm. and this is what this this piece of paper actually shows and this is how it shows it and i love that explaining that to people yeah i can tell you can see the passion on your face for the benefit of our listeners <laughs> <laughs> so um just a, a last few questions just to finish off really are there, are there any books that you read recently that you would share to care to share with 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 us books that you would recommend doesn't matter i'm a sort. trashy book reader i'm afraid it's okay I'm absolutely trashy. For all those staycation book. holidays we're about to embark on. Absolutely. I've, I've got a, a couple on, on the go at the moment. One's all about the FBI uh, in the States. And another one's a really lovely uh, series of books about an archaeologist up in Norfolk who, uh, who has a bit of a fling with a, with a, with a, a policeman. And, and there's always a case involving old bones and this policeman. So, um, so who's that by? Oh, no, I knew you were going to ask me that. Doesn't matter. For the, for the benefit of our listeners, we will stick the notes to the book in the show notes. I, I have them on my Kindle on my phone. You give me a few seconds, I can tell you. But <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. So what's your favourite quote? Do you have a favourite quote? My own favourite quote, one I use all the time. It's always all right in the end. It is always all right in the end. When I, I've had some fairly desperate moments, don't get me wrong. And you get up the next day, you have your breakfast, you do what you do and you face the day and you go through that day and the next day is another day and it always gets better and all those people who who struggle with mood and just difficult times go outside have a walk I've always gone for an early morning walk partly because I've got dogs but it's just the best time to go out and you can just I love because I live in Laxey going up somewhere high walk up a hill and look back down over the east coast of the island and it can be blowing a hooly lashing with rain or it can be absolutely beautiful and do you know there's a moment there to be taken by everybody so it's always all right in the end good it is thanks and where can people go to learn more about you and the work that you're doing well um business wise i have a website yep holistic business accounting is my tag because that's what i like to think we do we don't just look at the business we look at the whole person around that uh, involved with that business and we have a website uh, nicolabauka.co.uk you can find me on on twitter and facebook though i'm a shocking social media interactor um so you know if it was from six months ago apologies i've been busy um <laughs> but um uh or phone us, pop in. Do you know, people just walking off the street, love that. Yeah. Um, pick up the phone, email, um, email contact, all the contact details are on the website. Um, cool. Well, we'll put them in the show notes. So yeah. So, uh, yeah, get in touch. You know, we, we absolutely love our clients. Very good. So anybody who needs loving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know what? Some, some comfort, oh, you wouldn't believe the services we provide sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't Boxes know. of tissues. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the programme. It's been really a joy to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.